Welcome to Painting with a Scientist. I am Science Mom, but I like to do a painting show where I wear a crazy wig just for fun and then show you how to paint a landscape or something that relates to a scientific topic. Today, we are going to be learning all about Yellowstone. A welcome to those of you who are watching live and a special welcome to you if you are watching the replay. Hello to Deepa from Montreal, Claire, Leela, King Duck, King Daniel, Helper Madison, Queen Jane, King Crab. We have a lot of kings. King Cat, Queen Jane, Queen Poppy, and my crazy family. Super happy to have you guys here with us today. We are painting a portrait of Yellowstone today. Yellowstone is one of the most beloved national parks, I, I would say, in the entire world. Millions of people travel there every single year. And unfortunately, because of the, um, the current pandemic, Yellowstone is closed. It's closed. They just announced yesterday that they're going to be closed for the whole entire summer. And I thought it might be nice to paint a scene of Yellowstone and talk a bit more about this incredible, incredible area. We're going to be talking about what happens underneath the park as well. I'll show you really quick the colors that I'm going to be using today. I have a simple acrylic paint set. We are going to be using reds, oranges, browns, greens, and blues today. Those are going to be sort of our main colors, but don't worry. I will talk you through that as we paint. And as always, you are welcome to pause the video at any time if I'm going too quickly. That's the nice thing about an online painting lesson that's, that's recorded. You can just use that pause button to pause if you need a little more time to finish. And you can also use other materials. I make little outlines for all of my Painting with a Scientist videos. And for today's video, we actually have two outlines. Yellowstone, the Yellowstone PDF that I did, the first one, I did a very simplified magma chamber underneath. And then after a, after a night's sleep, I was thinking more about my drawing. And I decided that I wasn't quite happy with that simplified magma chamber because they've been able to use um, material that's kind of similar to how with an x-ray you can see inside the body. There are tools that scientists have to use waves to be able to see inside the Earth's crust. And they've mapped out the magma chambers underneath Yellowstone. And there are two of them. And they kind of look something like this. And again, this is not at all to scale. But we have one shallower lava chamber and then we have another bigger magma chamber. And I decided I wanted my drawing to be a little more accurate, so I updated it this morning. You can paint along with either one. I don't want you to feel like you have to rush to print out Yellowstone 2 if you've already printed out the Yellowstone PDF. Either one is just fine, and we'll be talking more about that as we go. All right. Oh, King Duck asked, what would happen if every single volcano erupted all at once? That would be very exciting and kind of frightening, I think. And I don't know that there's any way that it could happen, like that you could cause every volcano to erupt at once. But if it did, we would definitely have a lot more carbon dioxide and a lot more water vapor in our atmosphere all at once. Because anytime you have a volcanic eruption, you have the release of gas. And the main gases are CO2 and H2O, carbon dioxide and water. But you also would get sulfur dioxide going to the atmosphere too. That's another main gas that we get with volcanic eruptions. Um, the amount of lava that was produced would 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 be substantial as well. You definitely have more lava coming out. But all in all, our Earth is so big that even though we have several thousand volcanoes and maybe more than several thousand, I don't think there would be a super big effect. Elizabeth asked, can I use markers? You definitely can. You can use markers, colored pencils, anything that you would that you would like. All right. You guys ready? Here we go. I'm going to take my painting and tape it using painter's tape. I'm going to tape it to my little board here, and then I'm going to get my palette ready. And if you are following along, you don't have to tape your painting up. You can use, you know, just put it on the table. It is completely up to you. And once I've got my painting secured, I'm going to be getting colors for our sky. The sky is the first thing that I want to paint because it's always a good idea to do our background. And then once we have our background ready, then we're going to paint the foreground. And for our background, we kind of have three layers today. We have our sky behind the mountains in the back. We have our ground here around our big thermal hot spring. And then we have underneath the crust. 
And this little line here sort of shows us the crust of the earth. So I'm gonna bring you closer so that you have a better view of my painting. And then we will get right to it. Oops. All right, there we go. Hello to Afshin from Kansas, King Supercar, Queen Lady Bastard, and Delilah. Tell me if you guys can see now. I can bring us just a little bit closer if need be, but I can't come too much closer than that because then it's difficult for me to get into our painting. Now it's time to make our make our paints. So I'm using a little palette here and I'm going to add some white and some blue to make a light blue for our sky. And then after we paint our sky, I'm going to be using sort of a light tan for the ground here around the thermal spring because a lot of the springs in Yellowstone are hot enough that they tend to kill off the grass and plants around them. So we're not gonna see a lot of green by our thermal springs. It'll be mostly browns, light browns, and, and you do get kind of like these sulfury deposits around them too sometimes. All right, we've got our blue now, our light blue. I'm gonna add a little bit more water so that hopefully it goes a little further. And I'm gonna start out on top here, painting our sky. And then we have two plumes from geysers coming up into the sky. So I'm gonna just kind of lightly go around the edges there so that they stay white. Because when geysers erupt, you get plumes of white heading up and that white water vapor is pretty, pretty impressive. In 2018, we went to Yellowstone as a family in June and there was a geyser in Yellowstone called Steamboat that is one of the largest geysers in the world in terms of how much water and steam it produces. And when we walked by the Norris um, Geyser Basin, when we walked by Steamboat, there were maybe about 30 people sitting in deck chairs, um, just kind of camped out watching, watching the Steamboat Geyser. And Steamboat wasn't erupting when we walked by. It was just sort of not a major eruption, but it's always like kind of spouting up just a little bit of water. And so I asked, well, what's going on here? And the, it turns out that everyone who was there was a geyser enthusiast and they had been there for the last three days and were waiting to see if Steamboat would erupt. And I said, well, like, is it gonna erupt soon? And they said, well, it's Steamboat, so who knows? Steamboat is not a predictable geyser. Old Faithful is very predictable. That's probably the most famous geyser in Yellowstone. A lot of people have heard of Old Faithful. And you can you can time it to within minutes. It goes off on a very regular schedule. And people gather every day to see Old Faithful erupt. But with Steamboat, they were saying, well, it just all depends. You know, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be three days from now. One person we met there had been waiting for four days. So he came every single morning, as soon as the sun rose, sat there the whole entire day, and then went home when it got dark and came back again the next day. So I we, we watched for about an hour and a half, and then we went back to our campground. And then the next morning I checked to see if Steamboat had erupted. I checked a website and it said it hadn't erupted yet, so we went back. And when we went back, we waited for about an hour and a half, and then Steamboat erupted and went off. This was June 4th, 2018, and it's a video on my YouTube channel. It's listed under favorites if you wanna see the little video that I did about it. Oh my goodness, you guys, it was amazing. So enormous, just huge. Now I'm painting some brown, and we're gonna just paint in this whole background with brown. Leaving, um, leaving this area where we have the Grand Prismatic Spring, we'll leave that clear. So when it went off, when Steamboat went off, the sound was so loud um, and it went at least, you know, two, maybe close to 300 feet in the air. 
the height was just incredible. And it was just this huge plume of white running up. And to be watching it with a crowd of geyser enthusiasts who had been, you know, sitting there for the last several days made it really extra special and fun because there was just such a level of excitement. Kind of painting around my buffalo carefully. And we can definitely go back in and add add extra a little bit of green here and there to, to indicate that there are some plants here, but for the most part, this area is just gonna all be light brown. Now, since since that eruption of steamboat in 2008, it has entered into a period of being very active again, where it's been going off a lot. But before that, it hadn't gone off for years. So it, it's one of those geysers, not all geysers are predictable, like Old Faithful. A lot of them are erratic, meaning that they'll, they'll erupt regularly for a while, and then they won't. Or they can just, you know, they're not predictable at all, where you really don't know when you might see another, product, product, another eruption. Right now, Steamboat is fairly regular, where every, every few days we're seeing eruptions, and that's continued since 2008 when we saw that eruption in June. But we really don't know how long that's going to last. In the 60s, it went through a time period where it was pretty, it was pretty active as well. And you just, you just never know. As soon as we paint our, our background of mostly brown here, then we'll get started on our underground background. So this background is for the, you know, the main kind of foreground of Yellowstone. Then we're gonna do the underground, then we'll do our mountains, and then we'll be talking about kind of some of, some of these features here. And again, if you feel like, slow down, science mom, you're going too fast, you can always just pause the video, wait till you have your, your background colored or painted, whatever, whatever medium you're using, and then you can push play again and, and keep watching. That's totally an option. I'm, I'm leaving the, the little sort of the lines coming out from this, this pool blank because we're going to color those later on. All right, a little stripe down here at the base of our, our mineral formation. Whoop. And then Oh, and then we're going to do our mountains. And if you have specific questions about Yellowstone, drop them in the chat, because once we, once we paint our backgrounds, I have a couple photos to show you guys from our trip that we took there that I would love to share. So let me know if there are any questions that you have about this national park. Now for our mountains, I'm mixing together two greens. And then I'm going to add just a little bit of brown. And first, we're going to paint the sides of the mountains that are this way. Because when we paint mountains, usually in a painting or anytime you're outside, the sunlight's going to be coming from one direction. And these, this part of the mountain will kind of be more in shadow. And that part of the mountain will kind of be a little bit more light. And also, you have different vegetation that's going to grow on different slopes of a mountain. And so your mountain will look more realistic if one side of it is lighter and one side of it is darker. So I'm mixing together my paint and then checking the color. Ooh, that looks a little more turquoisey green than what I was intending. I'm going to add a little more of my dark green. And I'm going to add just a tiny bit more brown. And then I'm going to see how that looks. So now I've got a little more dark green, a little more brown. Mix that all together. Okay, I like that. That's looking a little more pine green. And what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna paint my mountains kind of this pine green color, but just on 
the one side of the slope. So just here and then here and then here we'll kind of do a little V down and then starting about right here I'm kind of do a little V down there as well. And now that I have that first part, that side of my mountains painted, I'm going to add the tiniest bit of dark blue. Just a tiny little bit of dark blue. Whoops. That ended up being a little more than a tiny bit. To kind of darken my green. And I think I want to add just the tiniest bit of black as well to make that green just a little bit black, a little bit darker. And I'm putting the, the black on the side so that if I, I can mix in just a little bit and check it. And that's, that's plenty dark. I don't want to mix in all the rest because then it'll be too dark. Now we'll test it out. And that looks about right. So now my mountains have kind of a nice two-tone appearance where the side that, you know, the south facing side is a little lighter. The north facing side is a little darker and that's going to make them look more realistic because your north facing slopes on mountains they're going to have more vegetation and usually like you know they'll have thick pine forests if we're talking about the yellowstone area the north facing slopes are going to have pine the south facing slopes are going to have scrub oak and more grass and not be as dark So there we go, our mountains, our mountains are done. And if we want with a different brush, we can just get a different brush that doesn't have any paint on it, but is slightly wet. We can sort of blend, blend some of those areas just a little bit. So our, oh no, shadows aren't too dark. And now I'm looking to see if I have any tissue paper because I'm getting a little green runaway right there. Kind of dab that up. And now our mountain background is done. All right. Next, for the next background that we're going to do, we're going to paint the background of our earth crust right here. So now we're going, you know, here's the sky, here's our mountains, here's our above ground view, and now we're going underneath. So for our underneath view, I want a very thick, dark color to be our crust line. So I'm gonna get a straight little bit of brown there, and then I'm gonna try to dry off my brush so my brush isn't very wet at all. And we're gonna paint straight across that line showing that we're going underground. I want that to be nice and thick. It's really amazing to think about what's happening underground Yellowstone because that's what powers the entire park. All of the geothermal features that we see, the hot springs, the geysers, the mud pots, all of it is driven by the heat that you have coming from underground. Whoops, and this line here is not nearly as thin or even as I was hoping, but that is totally okay. We're just gonna roll with it. That's my favorite thing about painting is that there's no such thing there's no such thing as mistakes in painting there are just whoops and anytime that you say whoops then you look at what you did what your oops was and you just make it part of the painting except when green paint runs down onto your landscape and then you grab some tissue and try and try and get rid of it but even, you know, if you're not able to fix it when something like that happens, just make it part of your painting. Ooh. There we go. There's the line of our crust. And now we're going to do a deeper, darker brown for this upper crust. And then the lower crust, we're going to add a little bit of red. And for now, I'm going to leave these mantle plumes. I'm going to leave those chambers blank because we'll fill them in in a minute. So I'm gonna grab our little burnt sienna here. I'm gonna add it, add it here to the brown I was using before. And then I'm gonna be fairly generous with the amount of water I use so that this paint is 
not too dark. So if I if I add just a little bit more water here, it's going to be a similar color to what we're using up here, but a little bit darker. I'm just going to come in. I'm going to kind of trace around our mantle chamber here. And as I'm tracing around our mantle chamber, so that then I can, whoops, then I can color in, color in the rest easily. And if you have a different printout than the one I'm doing, if you have the Yellowstone copy instead of Yellowstone 2, you can just follow the lines and trace around that other magma chamber. That is completely fine. You don't need to feel like you need to stop and print out a different handout. You can use either one. And if you're free painting, if you're not using an outline at all, but just free painting or free coloring, um, just kind of use your brush to draw a shape of your magma chamber and then paint around it. Yellowstone is often called a super volcano and a super volcano is kind of a, it's not a super, it's not a really technical term. It just refers to magma fields or, you know, areas they call them, they call them volcanic fields because there's more than one thing going on. You know, in, in, in Yellowstone, you don't just have one area where you have heat coming to the surface. You have a lot of areas where you have heat coming to the surface. And so we call the whole entire Yellowstone area can be called a super volcano because it's all related to this enormous magma chamber deep in the Earth's crust. And there are actually two of them. There's one in the upper crust and then there's one in the lower crust. So now we're gonna paint our lower crust and I want it to be a slightly different color and I want some indication that it's a little bit hotter. So I'm adding just a little bit of vermilion to my brown here. I'm gonna stir that in and see how it looks. And that definitely does look a bit redder. So we'll go ahead and paint that on. And actually, eh, I think that's a little too red. So I'm going to add in a little more brown. Sort of paint over with some brown and mix in, mix in a little bit of yellow, yellow ochre there. And a little bit more water. So this upper magma chamber is the one where a lot of the heat is coming from, but the lower chamber underneath is sort of powering the upper one. So you have two different chambers and they're actually mostly, mostly solid. There's only about 5% of the chamber that is melted, just a tiny amount that's melted. And in our first, first drawing that I did, that's what that little line at the bottom is supposed to represent is that you only have a small portion that is active and melted. The rest is fairly solid. One, one question that you'll see coming up if you start looking up things about the Yellowstone supervolcano is when will it erupt? Because it will erupt again. The question is when? And it doesn't look like it will happen anytime in our lifetime or our children's lifetime or our children's children's lifetime. It looks to be a long ways off. All right. I'm going to come around to the other side now. And I want to show you just a couple photos and talk a little bit more about Yellowstone before we finish. So if you have not yet done um, finish your backgrounds, keep painting along. And then if you have, I hope you'll just pause and join me for a couple photos because there are some really awesome things to know about the Yellowstone volcano. So first, I wanna point out that Yellowstone, the, the area around Yellowstone has more earthquakes than anywhere else in the continental US except for California. California has a lot of earthquakes. And again, most of these earthquakes are small ones, ones you're only gonna be able to recognize if you have instruments. But here's a map from um, the visitor center in, in the Yellowstone National Park. A picture I took of a map there that shows you all of the eruptions that took place in the last several decades around Yellowstone. You can see that there are a ton. And then let's talk a little bit about how geysers work because we're gonna be painting a geyser next. So geysers, 
are different from hot springs, mainly because there's a choke point. So you can see that there is water underground and this groundwater is going through cracks. And if it's a big hot spring, then the water just is heated, goes up through, path, through those cracks. And then you have a, a big pool that has water and steam coming out of it all the time. But if you have a choke point, then you get a geyser. And that means that there's some cavity, some body underneath the geyser that can fill up with water. And then there's a small point, usually where some rocks and things sort of went together and plugged, plugged up part of it. And pressure has to build up to a certain point. And then when the pressure builds up, all of the water will shoot out through that column. Check the chat real quick to see if anyone has any questions. Hello to King Cat and Helper Madison, King Supercar, this Bliss fam. What is a geyser? We'll be talking about that in just, we'll be talking about that right now. And I do have a video called um, Steamboat. It's on the favorites playlist in my YouTube channel. And that explains even more about how geysers work and shows you some footage from the Steamboat geyser eruption. So we have two geysers here that we're going to paint. And the underwater portion of our geysers is not visible. So underwater, or underwater, I can't believe I said that, you guys. Underground. The underground portion of our geysers is not visible. So these geysers, I'm going to get just a little bit of kind of a darker brown, and I'm going to paint the base here. Underneath these geysers, we have a system of cracks and kind of like a little cavern that can fill with water. And that water is superheated. And when it gets hot enough, then it will burst out the surface. And when it bursts out the surface, then you get your eruption of a geyser. Geysers almost always have two phases to their eruption. They have a water phase where you actually have water going up. And sometimes there can even be like bits of rock and things in, in with, mixed in with the water. And then they have a steam phase. And the steam phase is like all the hot air being released out of that, that geyser vent. So this one, this geyser over here is kind of already in its steam phase. Oh my goodness, whoops. There's now a brown streak in my sky. We can pretend like um, there was a big rock in our geyser and it went so high and then when it was raining back down, it is coming back down and kind of left a brown streak across our, our pitcher. That's what we'll pretend. So this geyser is in its steam phase. This one is just starting its water phase. And since our sky is blue and our geysers, you know, when the water is coming out, it's boiling hot water and mostly looks white, I'm going to get some just pure white paint. And we're going to try to paint and fill in some of that, that material coming up from our geyser. And this isn't going to look super different from what we have already. But I'm just going to take this little bit of white paint that's nice and thick, and I'm going to streak up, and then kind of curve over, streak up, curve over, up, curve over, up, like that. And then I'm going to get just a tiny bit of blue to sort of add some more texture to my streaks here. Streak, 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 streak. There we go. So there's our one geyser. And then this other one, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave white. But if I just leave the page white, that doesn't look quite as textured as if I actually paint it white. So I'm going to get my white paint nice and thick. And I'm going to paint in our steam phase to this geyser. And when we saw a steamboat erupt, we saw exactly that. The water phase was really loud. And you could see an incredible amount of runoff coming down from the geyser. And the shape of the geyser was, was pretty solid with water just shooting up. And then when it transitioned to the steam phase, now there wasn't as much water coming out with a little overflow area. And it looked a lot more like a billowing cloud and the sound changed. It sounded different when it went to its steam phase. And as I mentioned before, if you have a geothermal spring, and 
if you have a geothermal spring and there is hot underwater, hot water underground, and it's being heated really hot and coming up to the surface, if there's no choke point, you don't get a geyser, you get a hot spring. And Grand Prismatic Hot Springs is one of the most beautiful springs in Yellowstone. It's very famous and just gorgeous. And for this, to paint this, we're gonna want to have a bright, bright blue. And the middle blue, we're not gonna do anything to it. We're just gonna use this straight blue and paint a circle in the middle of our, our spring. And then we're gonna essentially make a rainbow going out from it. Because as you have the temperature change, and as some of the mineral content changes as well, you get different types of bacteria and archaea, different types of single-celled life forms that can live in this spring. And one of them, I believe it's called Thermus aquaticus, one of them made a huge difference to our, our, our to all of science. When they first, and, and let's talk about the difference between an extremophile versus an animal that can survive extreme conditions. So if you have a bacteria that is really tough, like, um, I don't know, or let's, let's take tardigrades. Tardigrades are super tough animals. They can survive really extreme conditions like going into outer space. But a tardigrade can't actually live in outer space. And it can survive going into a hot spring just about as hot as this one that we're painting here. But a tardigrade actually can't live inside the hot spring. So we would say that it, the tardigrade is a really tough animal, but it's not an extremophile. File being the same wor root word as philia. You know, if you if you love something, you're a, like a, if you love books, you're a bibliophile. Extremophiles thrive in extreme conditions. And, um, Thermus aquaticus, I believe I'm saying that right. I hope so. If not, forgive me. The, the extremophile bacteria that we first discovered in the hot springs, it totally changed almost every field of science because it contains an enzyme called TAC, TAC polymerase. And this enzyme we were able to harness and use to amplify DNA. So if you've ever heard of like DNA fingerprinting, like if you watch a, you know, a, a show where there's a detective trying to solve a crime and they, you know, they match the DNA and say, aha, it came from this person. That's using this enzyme that actually was discovered in a hot spring pool in Yellowstone. So sometimes we can look at an area like this with these bacteria that can survive and thrive at super hot temperatures. And we might think to ourselves like, oh, that's cool, but who really cares? You know, what, what difference does it make? Well, you, the thing is you don't know what difference it might make. So much of what we discover in science comes from things like this, where there will be, there will be a discovery where someone says, hey, here's an enzyme that can live at these high temperatures. And then they realize like, oh, holy cow, if we take this same, same enzyme and then heat up this sample of DNA and use it to control when the enzyme is, is active, we can actually amplify the DNA and we can do DNA fingerprinting. So DNA fingerprinting printing came about because of this enzyme. And I'm realizing I should have, I should have made my blue circle just a little bit more oblong here, but we'll just kind of draw out the green a little bit more. So we have blue in the center. Now we're going to green. And then we're gonna do a lighter green and go to yellow. And then orange is gonna be what's coming out of the edges here. Grand Prismatic Springs is a huge, huge hot spring in Yellowstone. And it's the one that I have a picture of on the thumbnail of our video. It is a beautiful, beautiful spring, really amazing to see. And the colors are caused by the different types of bacteria and minerals that you have in the spring, in the hot spring. I'm going to finish up just a little bit more green here. This green I don't have mixed with blue, so the color is going to be just slightly different. And then I'm going to mix in yellow for our next layer. So a little more green around the edge here. 
And now I'm mixing in a little bit of yellow with my green. I'm going to try and trace carefully right along that same edge. And then we're going to get to our, our yellow yellow. But to paint on the yellow, it's going to help quite a bit if my paint has dried so that my yellow doesn't just get lost into the green. So I'm going to finish my, my light green here in the back. And then we're going to paint our bison while we're waiting for this to dry. Whoops. There's another, there's another oops moment. But it's okay because we're painting. And oops are completely all right. All right, let's talk a little bit about bison. Bison are amazing animals. And our bison here, I'm going to want to outline just a little bit better before I start painting him. So I'm going to take some of this brown that I used before when I made the background. And I'm going to go right around the edges of our bison. And if you have small brushes, they will be useful here. Or if you wanted to just abandon brushes and paints and use colored pencils to color in your bison, you could totally do that too. There is no rule that says that your painting must be made of 100% paint. You can use other materials. Bison are related to cows, to cattle. They're pretty similar. But the bison is a lot bigger. It's got huge, huge muscles up here that sort of give this hump on its back. They're also quite a bit more wild. You can't, you can't tame them um, in the same way that you can cattle. Our domesticated cattle are really pretty docile. You need to be careful with bulls. And Math Dad has a couple fun, fun kind of exciting stories about getting chased by a bull. Um, both. Him and his dad at times have had to run from their life from a, a bull on the dairy farm. But you can, you know, if you don't have too far to run, you can run away from a bull. You would never want to run away from a bison. If you get too close to a bison, and this happens every single year in Yellowstone, if you get too close to a bison and if they decide that you're a threat and they run at you, that can be game over. They are really powerful and big animals. And if they decide to charge you and knock you over, or if they use these horns to, you know, hook and throw you, they'll do that too, you can get seriously injured or even killed by bison. So they're really neat animals to see, but you do not want to get too close to a bison. Before European settlers came to North America, bison roamed all over from, you know, the Yellowstone area all the way into the east, but they were mostly across the Great Plains. And then they were hunted, hunted almost to extinction. But fortunately, there was effort made to save the species. And Yellowstone now has some of the biggest bison herds, it has the biggest bison herds in the world. We're going to paint this part of the bison where he, where they have the shaggy winter fur. We're going to paint that a slightly different color than the rest of the bison. So I'm doing this first here, I'm trying to do it sort of feathery, like it's this shaggy winter coat. I'm gonna come down and get that leg. And I'm, I'm using the dark brown mostly because I want the bison to stand out from the background. Whoops. There's another whoops. If you're having whoops, when you do your painting too, that's completely okay. This bison is kind of tricky because the legs are so small. And if I had more time, I would probably just bust out the colored pencils and be like, all right, bison, I'm gonna do you with colored pencils because that'll be easier. Oh my gosh, Math Dad just opened the door and said, you got five minutes. Well, that's unfortunate. All right, bison, we're gonna paint you real fast. And I think I'm not going to be able to finish this painting in five minutes, but I will do my best to hurry up a little bit. I'll get that other leg there. <laughs> and then the tail. And for my head, I'm going to lighten up my brush a little bit, get some of the paint off of it. 
and I'm going to try and just sort of lightly come through here. So then you can still kind of see that eye. There's our head of our bison. And then for the horn, I'm going to do a slightly, slightly lighter brown. Whoop. You know what? He looks like a camouflaged bison to me. So that's kind of handy for this particular bison. He's camouflaged. All right, let's get back to our hot spring and finish the outline of our hot spring. I'm going to grab some yellow and we're going to come around the edge here with some nice bright yellow. The colors on this hot spring are so bright you almost have to see it to believe it. I remember the first time that I saw a picture of Grand Prismatic Spring, I thought it was I thought it was photoshopped. I was like, nah, there's nothing that looks like that in real life. And then and then when I, I looked it up and realized that it was real, I was super impressed. Like, whoa, what causes all those colors? And the answer is archaea and bacteria, these extremophiles. Because as you go out from the center, the temperature is cooling, cooling, cooling. And the more it cools, the better suited it becomes for different species of bacteria and they have different colors. And the way that these bacteria work is kind of amazing. So we get our energy from, you know, from food, from breaking down food. Bacteria, they can get their energy from so many different sources. And some of these bacteria in here, they'll be harvesting certain minerals that are in the water and breaking down those minerals. Other bacteria will be um, actually being a bit photosynthetic there are so many different types of algae and bacteria that you can find in Yellowstone around these different hot springs. And then get just a little bit of water now. And continue this orange all the way around. And if you look at pictures, especially aerial pictures of Grand Prismatic Spring, you'll see that the water comes out of the spring and then it sort of spills over and you get these, these tendrils of orange algae mats that, that go out from the center. And some of them go one direction, some of them go in another direction. And over time, they might change because the algae sort of fills up and clogs the area so that then water can't flow through. And then the water will divert and go somewhere else and then you'll get new algae growing there. So it's a constantly changing environment. And there are actually some insects that are specially adapted to, to live on algae mats like this. They can't live close to you know the, the orange and the yellow where it's really hot, but if you get further away from the really hot area, then you get areas where you'll see these tiny little larvae of different flies that live on the algae and eat the algae and lay their eggs there. And then they go through metamorphosis and become winged flies and then they lay more eggs and you get these other larvae that eat the algae. So there's like a whole little ecosystem within this area where you've got, got these mats. It's really pretty cool. Just a little more orange here around our spring. All right. And then for this area here, this little drawing that I did here, was kind of inspired by Mammoth Hot Springs. And in Mammoth Hot Springs, the minerals that are coming out of the spring are so rich in different types of calcium that they actually form these this large terrace. So I'm going to paint kind of an edge around here. And then we'll, we'll paint a light blue on the inside for the pool. And then you get these stripes of different colors and some of them can be really bright and just beautiful colors that come down from the calcium deposits of the pool. And I'm curious, I'm gonna come over to this other side real quick and check the chat. Let me know in the chat if you have been to Yellowstone. I'm curious how many, how many people watching right now have actually been to Yellowstone? <laughs> I'm seeing, seeing several, 
So I think the chat is a little bit delayed. I'm seeing several things about a rooster and, and other, other things happening in the chat right now. So has anyone else been to Yellowstone before? All right, Walker says, no. Pixelbit says, I have. Queen says, possibly. Queen says, can I have a shout out? Shout out, Queen, You're, there's a shout out. Um, anyone else been to Yellowstone? King Crab says, no. Walker says, no. Sharon says, haven't yet. Queen Molly says, she, or Molly D says that she's been to Yellowstone. Uh, Alicia says, hasn't been to Yellowstone. Hopefully it will open up again soon. And someday, those of you who haven't gone someday, you'll be able to make a trip because it is an incredible, incredible place to see. But while Yellowstone is closed and, you know, in the meantime, there are some amazing videos that you can look up about this place. And then, of course, we've got our painting here today. Grand Prismatic Springs, it's worth looking up a picture of because the formations that you get are really just incredible. You get these terraced pools, and as the temperature underneath changes, the direction and the amount of water changes too. So it's something that's always evolving, and it looks different every year. As the pools get higher and higher, eventually the water flow might change so that then water's not coming out of that, that area anymore, and then they would, then they would stop. And now that we have whoops, our terrace painted, I'm going to grab another brush and we're going to add some blue for the water. Because in most of these pools, the water does have a bluish color, although sometimes it can be kind of a yellowish green. It just depends. But for just for fun and for the contrast here, I'm going to paint these pools blue. When we went to Yellowstone, one of the things I thought was really cool was to see a chart of the pH of the different formations. So you might think like, oh, a hot spring that has dissolved minerals in it, that would be acidic. Well, it all depends. Some hot springs are very, very strongly acidic, like just as acidic as battery acid. So if you dropped, you know, dropped your watch into the spring by accident, come back a couple hours later, it wouldn't be there anymore. Your watch would have dissolved. They can dissolve metal. Others are very, very basic, and same thing. They're so basic that they're really caustic, and they can dissolve just about anything that would be dropped in there. Um, and just for the record, you should never intentionally drop anything into a hot spring. There are a couple examples of hot springs on Yellow in Yellowstone that were actually ruined. There's a, a little geyser that people used to throw pennies in for good luck, and so many people put pennies in there that they clogged it up, and now the geyser doesn't doesn't fountain anymore because it got plugged up. And then in between, you do have some geysers and hot springs that are fairly neutral, where the water's hot, but it's, you know, you drop a watch in there by accident and the watch would still be there, you know, decades later. Now, we're going to paint our magma chambers and talk a little bit about what's happening underneath Yellowstone. As we mentioned earlier, Yellowstone is a super volcano. And that means that there is an enormous area underneath that has magma. It has a magma chamber, and that magma chamber has a lot of heat. And the heat coming up through the cracks in the ground and heating groundwater, that heat is what forms all of these features that we talked about in Yellowstone. The mineral deposits, the hot springs, the geysers, they're all formed from that heat. But these magma chambers are not liquid. There's actually only, they only estimate that about 5% of the magma chamber is liquid, and the rest is pretty much solidified. And there's a big magma chamber, really, really big one, down in the inter inner crust, and then there's a smaller one in the outer crust. And most of the heat is coming from this smaller one, but the larger one is kind of heating the smaller one. So it's like a kind of like a double boiler. Like you've got the area with less heat up here, and then you've got the bigger one that is heating the smaller one. And then down below this big one, you have a plume coming from the core of the earth. And this mantle plume is what is heating the entire thing. And the cool thing about the mantle plume is that the mantle plume 
is pretty much stationary. It's been there for a long time, for millions of years, and it's not moving anywhere. But the crust is moving. The North American crust is moving to the south and to the west. And so that means that if you look at a map of where we've had activity from this hotspot, it's, it's moving. It started out in kind of southern Idaho, and now it's up in Wyoming, and it looks like it's moving to the northeast. But what's happening is actually the plate is moving the opposite direction. There we go. I'm now going to get just a little bit of paint to sort of fill in these areas here so that we don't have any white peeking out. Whoops. And once I fill in kind of those spots there, then our very last little touch is going to be add, adding just a little bit of green around our, our bison. Because I gotta say, I feel a little bit bad for this bison being totally surrounded by, totally surrounded by brown. And there is a lot of vegetation in Yellowstone as well. There are a lot of areas where the ground is not superheated and you can have trees and grass and all sorts of things like that. So I'm gonna get a little bit of water here and get a little bit of green. I'm just gonna do quick little brush strokes. And kind of add in a little bit of green here. And that's looking way messier than I intended, but we're going with it. That's all right. A little bit of green here, a little bit of green over here. Get just a little bit more. And if you have extra time and want, I left space here so that if you wanted to add in other animals, you could. You could draw a little squirrel over here. You could draw an elk. You have space to do extra animals if you want. All right, now we'll try to do like a little tuft of grass here. Some grass for our bison, maybe. That's not looking too grassy, but that's okay. And then a little more green here so that he's not quite as camouflaged. You can kind of see him. There we go. I like it. I'm calling it good and done. And as a, a quick last thing before we go, I do have just a couple more pictures to show you. I'll check the time. Whoop, 10.08. I am a little bit over, but that's all right. I will, I will head back out and help Math Dad with our yard project in just a minute. All right, let me show you real fast um, a couple things about, about Yellowstone, because as we mentioned, this magma chamber down here is what is driving all of the amazing things that are happening in Yellowstone, all the geysers, all of the hot springs, but there is the worry, like what if it all erupted? Because it has erupted in the past. First, here is a, an image of what that top plume and the bottom plume likely looks like. And again, most of it is crystallized and solid. They estimate that only about 5% of it is, is liquid. And for it to erupt, you would need to have a lot more of it become liquid. And it doesn't look like that's going to be happening anytime soon. But Yellowstone has erupted in the past. When it erupted, the past eruptions, there are three main ones. The first one, which is colored yellow on this map, was the Huckleberry Ridge eruption. That was 2.1 million years ago, a long time ago. And it was about 6,000 times as much ash as Mount St. Helens which is just unbelievable. The amount of ash, in fact, if you look at the map here, they show you how much land it covered. And it's that orange region there. So that first eruption covered like half of the United States in ash. And then our second eruption made a caldera of the shape of that red, that red circle there that you see, the one that says second Yellowstone event. That was the Mesa Falls eruption 1.3 million years ago. And to see how much land it covered, let's look back at our map. The second eruption from 1.3 million years ago did that yellow circle there. So it wasn't as big, 
And you can tell the ash fall wasn't as big and neither is the crater that it left. The crater for that second eruption is a lot smaller. And then the third eruption made another huge crater. That was only 640,000 years ago. It ushered in an ice age because it put out so much ash. Look at the map here, the dark red that is kind of underneath the other three, that's a huge triangle. That's the ash deposits from the third eruption, the Lava Creek eruption that was 630 years ago. Now, if you start researching about Yellowstone and super volcanoes, you will quickly find a whole lot of websites and sites that are all about like, oh, the disaster is imminent, the big one is about to happen. And every time that you see a change in Yellowstone, which is pretty much constantly, you will see all this chatter about like, it's, it's gonna happen, the big eruption is coming. If Yellowstone did erupt again um, tomorrow, which is not going to happen, um, but if it did, then it would be game over for a lot of people because you would have so much ash go up into the sky that it would cause it would cause climate change unprecedented. It would be kind of crazy. But here's why we know that's not going to happen. Not tomorrow and probably not for centuries upon centuries. And it's because we can tell that these lava chambers, these magma chambers here, they're mostly solid. They are crystalline right now. There's only about 5% that is melted. And that means that it's not ready to go off. There are a lot of scientists, a lot of volcanologists who are monitoring this all the time. So there is a um, research station, the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, that is monitoring earthquakes and the movement of the ground and continuously taking readings. And if this were gonna go off, we would have advance warning. We'd have a long time to prepare and get ready. But again, most likely our current estimates are that it's hundreds and hundreds of years in the future. I hope you enjoyed learning more about Yellowstone National Park, which is one of my favorite places, just an incredible, incredible ecosystem. And the nature and wildlife there is fascinating. And then the geothermal activity, the things that you have happening beneath of the ground are fascinating as well. So goodbye to Catherine, to David, to Mara, to King Supercar Queen, Thank you so much to everyone who joined me today on the live show. And if you're watching the replay, thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed painting your version of this painting. And I would love to see your work. If you would like to share it online and tag me, um, I would really enjoy seeing what you came up with because every painting is different. And I really enjoy seeing all of the creative work that happens with our show. Goodbye to Molly D, to AR, to King Crab, to Walker, to PPC Builders, to Catherine Tang, King Potato. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Take care.